So last week we started a new series on, <clears throat> we know all about what it is to be healthy and we define that all the time. Now help us know what healthy looks like and healthy tools to get healthy. So what I said is we're going to go through the 12 needs and work through that and learn how to meet those 12 needs in healthy ways. So just as an intro to that tonight, <clears throat> I've used this before. On the right is a healthy person. So high energy at the top where they we call the performance zone. But a healthy person performs, they serve, they do their job, they work with their children, etc. But they reach a point where they say, now I need some downtime, I need to recover. And they know how to meet their needs so that they're able to go back and perform again. And they can do that for the rest of their life. Perform, downtime, take care of self, perform. The difference with complex trauma is it's on the left. And you're in survival mode. And what survival mode means is you are always on guard. You can't relax. You can't stop and meet your needs and have downtime. So in complex trauma, you push yourself until you burn out. And that's the body's only way of recovering. Now, why I tell you that is a lot of people from complex trauma who have pushed themselves till they burn out come into recovery still operating that way. So they do recovery, push, 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 push. They haven't learned how to meet their needs, so they just push themselves till they burn out. And usually that is a relapse. And so to get recovery well, you have to stop doing that, and you have to start living on the right side, and that means learning how to meet your needs in healthy ways. And that's what this series is about. So last week we talked about the first need, which is pleasure. Tonight we're going to the second need, which is food. And some of your ears perked up last week when I mentioned that we're going to talk about food. Food, as you are aware, food and water, most basic physical need that we have necessary to stay alive. And our culture has done probably the greatest at giving us lots of information about healthy food choices, all of that kind of healthy eating stuff. So I don't want to do any of that tonight because <clears throat> you can get that anywhere. I want to take it deeper. And so what is interesting to me is that our society, who has more information about food than probably hardly any other nation in the world, and yet we have huge issues around food. So it's like all this information doesn't seem to be helping people. There's all kinds of money being spent on dieting, on exercise programs, on liposuction, on stomach surgeries, etc., etc. I came across this by Global News. There's no, no other industry in the world that makes so much money but fails so many people as the food industry or the diet industry. So that it goes on to say this, the weight loss sectors have been growing by about 6% a year since the 1980s. In other words, dieting programs, exercise programs, all of those things, they're making more money each year by about 6%. But at the same time, obesity rates have continued to climb steadily in North America. And it was estimated in 2013 in Canada that Canadians spent $7 billion dollars on dieting programs. And in the United States, they spent $65 billion. And so that's why the first quote says, there's no other industry that makes so much money that has failed so many people. So I go, what's our culture missing? It seems to have all the information. It tells you how to eat healthy, all your healthy food. 
and we ignore a lot of it, or we do it for a little while, quit. Do it again, quit. And so what is going on? And so that's why I wanted to talk about this, because I don't think our culture has factored in how complex trauma changes people's relationship to food. And so I want to look at that now, and I also want to just add some extra challenges that everybody in Canada faces just because we live in Canada. And so I hope that you'll begin to realize that there are deeper reasons for why we eat the way we eat other than what our society is telling us. And unless we deal with those deeper issues, our society can give us tons of information, but it's not going to make a lasting difference. So let me begin. I think, and it's my opinion, and there's lots of evidence now, I think, to support it. Dr. Gaber Maté talks a lot about it. But he and I would say that the majority of eating disorders are connected to complex trauma. So when a person comes to me and say, says, will react, help me with my eating disorders, I say it sure will. Because what comes out of complex trauma is an unhealthy relationship to food for most people. So we have anorexia, bulimia, and then binge eating and purging. The second thing that happens in our culture, and it's a cultural thing, is we have put so much emphasis, especially for women, on their body and how they look. And so if you have any fat, then you should feel that you're not desirable, that nobody would want you. And it puts tremendous pressure on women, which has led to constant dieting, trying to get the perfect body. And we swim in a culture that thinks that way. We watch TV that constantly projects that. And it does influence people. And it's a big concern of mine of how it's affecting young girls coming up in our culture today. So we got a cultural stuff going on. But some of you with complex trauma or just in your family, you had family dynamics that weren't healthy in relationship to food. So you had a mom, let's say, who every time you turn around was starting a new diet. And every January she was starting a new diet and a new exercise program. And you just grew up with that kind of thinking all the time. And then another piece that comes out of complex trauma is that shame piece. And so shame says, I don't like myself. So in order to get good feelings about myself, I need others to like me. And then what happens with that is if I'm going to get others to like me, i got to have a good body. So that emphasis can come out of shame. Or for others with shame, I need to control my eating perfectly or I'm down on myself. I beat myself up because I'm failing. I'm a loser. I can't do anything right. So shame can affect our relationship with food and how we think about it. And then for some of you, you got a cultural stuff, you got a family stuff, but then you went to school and you were made fun of or bullied because you were a bit pudgy or heavy or overweight. And you were teased about that and called names. And it hurt you so much. And you were kind of put in the outcast group because of your weight. So those are just some of the things that you have probably grown up with in your culture. Now let me go back to the complex trauma world within the family. I've had many clients say to me that they eat their emotions. So when they're feeling stress, they eat. When they're feeling anxiety, they eat. When they're depressed, they eat. And they go back in their thinking and they remember as a little child when they were crying and grandma didn't like their crying. It made grandma uncomfortable. So she said, have a cookie. That'll make you feel better. 
And that started a pattern that if you're sad, you eat and that'll make you feel better. So that's what we mean by eating your emotions. So what you can see right there is that what you were doing with food was trying to meet an emotional need. Now, food was designed to meet physical needs, but what just happened is the wires got crossed and you're using food now to try to meet an emotional need. And what happens with that is it seems to work, but it doesn't. It leaves you empty and a bit heavier afterwards. Many people, as they realize kind of the emptiness that they feel, they may not know why, they just have always felt that way. There's been a hole in their heart and they haven't understood that their basic needs haven't been met. But what they have found is when they eat, it seems to fill the emptiness. And so they begin to eat whenever they feel any emptiness. So again, trying to meet a need, an emotional need, a soul need with food. Then another part of our culture and I was thinking about this this week. Do you realize that if you go to AA, there's food, coffee, and food? If you come to Finding Freedom, there's coffee and food. If you go to a social event, there's food. So we are a culture where social events, there's an unwritten rule that you have to have food. And so you're bombarded with it as a regular thing when you go out with friends or social events. Another thing that can happen with food in a complex trauma is this. Children who are in complex trauma where their life is chaos, they feel to that everything's out of control. And they try to gain control, but they can't because the big people in their life aren't cooperating. And so what they begin to do is look for things that they can control that will cause them to feel some stability and some control and will take away some of the fear that they're feeling. And so some fine food is something they can control. And so they become very rigid around food as a way of trying to regain control. The flip side of that, some kids grow up with super controlling parents where parents want to control everything about them, what they do, who they see, etc., etc. So they look for ways where they can rebel and give mom and dad the finger and mom and dad can't do a thing about it. And food is one way they can rebel. And so that, to them, actually gives them pleasure at a subconscious level because now they can make mom and dad upset but mom and dad can't control what they do or don't eat. Next one, some children who didn't get much validation, they got validation from grandma because they ate so much food. And grandma just felt great. There weren't, wasn't a thing left on the plate. And she might have said, I love having you come to visit because you eat everything and you eat so much. It just makes me so happy. And you go, I love that validation. So now everywhere I go, I'm going to eat everybody under the table. And that will be my banner of pride at how much I can eat or I never leave any leftovers. Okay, next one. Some of you might have grown up in a family where mom and dad portioned out your plate. So you didn't get to choose how much to put on your plate. They portioned it out and gave it to you and said you're not leaving till it's all gone. And so you ate beyond feeling full. You had to keep eating because mom and dad wouldn't allow any leftovers. And so some of you had that. Okay, back to society. We live in a culture where there's food that's constantly available, lots of snacks. Do you realize, and I've, I've thought of this in some of the wacky moments in my brain, do you realize that there could only be one food in the world, brown rice? That could be it. 
But we have thousands and thousands of types of foods and ways of serving foods and spices for foods that appeal to all kinds of different tastes. So there's an endless variety of opportunity that can be super, super tasty. And so that presents a problem when you live in a prosperous country where there's tons of food available and very tasty treats. You just live with that. And the next one. Some people have become disciplined in their eating, not just because it gets some validation at home, but because it, in their church it makes them feel they're more spiritual than other people. And so they become self-righteous about how slim their body is, and they judge everybody that's a bit overweight. Some of you might have grown up with that. Okay, now I want to come to food addiction. So there is such a thing, we call it a process addiction. It's when you take a, an activity that's based on a human need, and you make it something you keep doing and keep doing until it becomes a problem. And so food addiction, for many people, is they're using food to numb pain. So they're eating their emotions. They're using food to give pleasure to an empty life. They're using food to help them cope. And so that sets them up for becoming addicted to it because food wasn't designed to serve those purposes. But it does give instant gratification, it does numb pain, it does make you feel a little better, and it does help you cope for the moment. But the long-term consequences are where the trouble begins to come, okay? So the next thing with that to understand is food, especially eating with people, but food plus people creates all the chemicals of connection. And so when you eat food, it releases dopamine in the brain. It releases the endorphins that cause you to feel good and connected. And so food serves the purpose of giving you the same feelings as healthy connection was designed to do. And so that's where it can become an addiction. Now, if you do have a food addiction, what you've probably realized is that there could be many, many different things that trigger subconsciously or consciously the desire to eat. So it could be stress, depression, anxiety, sadness, boredom, discontent, on and on. And so part of recovery from food addiction is learning what triggers you to want to use food to meet an emotional need, okay? I say to people with food addictions all the time, you actually have a more challenging job in recovery than people who are drug addicts or alcoholics because with food addiction, food is something you still have to have. A drug addict and an alcoholic they can have total abstinence. But with food, you can't have total abstinence or you die from starvation. And so that makes food addiction recovery extra challenging because you still got to eat. You just got to learn to eat for the right reasons and to control that. Another thing that I say to people is, in our culture today, food addiction Exercise addiction are the socially acceptable addictions. And so you can have everybody say, stop drug addiction, stop alcoholism. But you don't hear anybody saying, stop having people become food addicts or exercise addicts. It's an, a, a, um, a culture where that is considered acceptable behavior for many, many people. Okay? Okay. So what I have tried to emphasize, and I want to say it again, food addiction is all about getting your wires crossed. 
It is about using food to meet an emotional need. So unless you learn to meet those emotional needs in healthy ways, you're going to struggle with your food addiction recovery. Because that still will be where your brain goes when you're feeling those needs that you haven't learned how to meet in a healthy way. Now let me give you one more piece around this. One of the things I say to clients that come in with drug addiction and alcohol addiction is be prepared. You're stopping drug addiction and alcohol addiction, but you're letting your emotions thaw out and you're becoming aware of your needs, but you're not able to meet all of your needs in a healthy way right away. So you're going to live in early recovery with some unmet needs. Your brain doesn't like unmet needs. And your brain is going to start to say, I got I to gotta get rid of that emptiness or that uncomfortable feeling. Okay, what am I going to do? Can't go to drugs, can't go to alcohol. Oh, what else could I do? Well, let's start a food addiction. And you cross addict. And do you realize that in early recovery, studies have been done, most addicts in early recovery, especially residential programs, gain at least a pound a week. Because food becomes their new addiction. And then they get in a relationship and sex, and then that takes over and becomes their next new addiction. So the danger in recovery from drugs and alcohol is that you can easily cross into making food your new way to medicate, your new way to feel better, your new way to try to meet those emotional needs. And that is a very challenging thing. So let me say this again. We live in a culture that is focusing on symptoms only. So they're saying, you're overweight, stop eating so much, go on a diet. They're not asking, why are you not eating well in the first place? They're making it sound like you just don't have good self-will, self-discipline. And if you just did this or you knew more about calories and stuff like that, it would fix the symptom. If you come from complex trauma, you know that our society is basically putting band-aids on the problems that are symptoms. So what I want you to understand is that a person with complex trauma, they shut down emotionally because it's dangerous to feel. It makes you weak to have feelings. They shut down their conscience, but those things still operate subconsciously. You just disconnect from them. And so sub subconsciously, you still feel emptiness. Subconsciously, you feel dead inside. Subconsciously, you feel anxiety and depression. And your brain is working to solve that. And when it finds food, it says, this seems to help. Let's do more. And now you overdo food. And that is the beginning of a food addiction. So... If you want help with your food problems, don't just do band-aids. Start to understand why you've been eating and having an unhealthy relationship with food. Next thing that I want you to see is our culture is spending all kinds of money trying to help us meet physical needs. So here's how to get in shape. Here's how to eat healthy. Our culture is really doing a very poor job at teaching people how to meet emotional needs. And that's where the problem is. And so what we're going to get to in meeting these needs in healthy ways, these 12 needs, is learning to meet those needs, those deep emotional needs. Because until you do, addiction will be the brain's way of trying to fix those problems. So that is a big thing. Okay, so as long as you are disconnected from emotions and that world down there, you will probably not eat in healthy ways. You will continue to struggle. So that's where we have to begin. But 
We're going to get there in just a minute. Okay, let me just back up from that. Okay, so that's complex trauma, how it messes up relationships to food. Let's back up and say, okay, what, what's the purpose of food anyways? Don't know if you think about those kind of things. I do. Number one, food is the gasoline that keeps this physical engine going. It is the energy source to keep us alive physically. But I think there's actually a second use for food. I think as you look through history, every culture used food as a way to bring people together to help create social connectedness. So if you go to any culture and there's like a Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter, people came together to celebrate. And so guess what they did in those times? Everybody over eight, but just for those times. And the focus was not just food, the focus was connecting. And so I think food still can play a role in bringing people together. Okay, next thing I want you to think about is this. So we as human beings, we have physical needs, emotional needs, intellectual needs, relational needs, spiritual needs. So we're multifaceted beings. I think that what we learn about meeting physical needs teaches us about meeting Emotional needs, intellectual needs, spiritual needs, relational needs. So let me explain. Eating and drinking are ongoing needs. So a baby isn't born, you feed them once and they're good for life. You got to eat several times a day. So what does that tell us? You got to keep feeding your emotional world. You got to keep feeding your spiritual world. You got to keep feeding your intellectual world. You don't just say, okay, I got my, <clears throat> my emotional fix or my spiritual fix. I'm good. All the other needs follow the same pattern as physical needs. Eating. So there has to be ongoing. So ESR, emotional, spiritual, relational. And I think that's just an important thing that we need reminders every time we sit, to, sit down to eat. To say, have I been feeding my emotions? Have I been feeding my intellect, my spirit? Those become just little signs saying, don't forget, you just don't have physical needs, you got other needs as well. Second, <clears throat> our physical needs have a built-in mechanism to tell us when they need to be met. So if you're hungry or you you're, don't have enough food, you feel hunger. If you don't have enough water, you feel thirst. It's a built-in mechanism that alerts us to that need. Do you realize that you have an emotional thirst mechanism? You have a relational thirst mechanism, a spiritual thirst mechanism. You have a longing. You have a deep drive, desire. And so I think again, physical needs are designed to say, pay attention to your emotional hunger, your spiritual hunger, your intellectual hunger, because they're there if you stop and listen. And so I would encourage you as part of developing tools to say, okay, food, part of its purpose is to teach me about my other needs. So I'm feeling hunger right now. Let's stop and do an inventory. Am I hungry emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, and relationally? And what do I do if I sense and realize I'm hungry in those areas? Okay? Third thing. You can mistrain the hunger mechanism. You can distort it. Okay? So, what's des the design is, is when you are in need of food, you have hunger. But you realize if you overeat and overeat and overeat, that the next time you feel hunger, it isn't because you're hungry. It's because your stomach is shrinking. You're not truly hungry. Your stomach is just rea reacting to shrinking. 
So what you've done by overeating, you've mistrained the hunger mechanism. Okay? I don't know if any of you know what pica is or pica. That's, they usually refer to it with pregnant ladies where you eat mud or you eat drywall or you eat chalk. And all of a sudden you're, you've got a hunger for stuff that has no nutritional value. And what it is saying is, and so it's not just with people who are pregnant, but what they're finding is people with eating disorders, that pica is now listed as an eating disorder where people will start eating dirt and all of that stuff as part of what fills them up. They've mistrained their hunger. So we can mistrain our emotional hunger system, our spiritual hunger system, and we can be eating junk food, thinking it satisfies, and it's making us sicker. Okay, and then I tell people all the time about emotional anorexia. So what happens with physical anorexia is if you ignore the hunger impulse long enough, you will soon not feel it anymore. So every time you feel hunger, you ignore it, you push it down, and pretty soon you can go months without eating and you don't feel any cravings for food. That is physical anorexia. You can do the same with your emotions. You can ignore your emotions, ignore your emotions to the point where you no longer feel your emotions. So what happens in people with food eating disorders in getting healthy, you've got to retrain your hunger mechanism. And so what you do in recovery is you retrain your emotional hunger mechanism, your spiritual hunger mechanism, so that it gets to be healthy again. And it takes time to retrain that. Number four, we are not naturally discerning when it comes to food. So, a child, everything goes in their mouth. Could be dog poop, could be a paper clip. It just all goes in their mouth. And then, once they find sugar and sweets, that's their preference over anything healthy. So, we have to train a child to eat healthy. And so, we have to train ourselves in recovery, not just eat healthy physically, but to have a healthy emotional diet, a healthy intellectual diet, spiritual diet, etc. And so those are all things we can learn from the physical need part, the food part. Okay, let me go to practical suggestions. And like I said at the beginning, I'm not going to go and give you kind of all of the research the society gives us around healthy food choices and healthy eatings and different types of things. You can find all of that very easily. But let me say this up front. Don't start a diet if you're not dealing with your underlying issues. You're setting yourself up to fail. So some of those underlying issues are your shame stuff, your body image stuff. So th that's where you have to begin if you're going to deal properly with the food. So eating is a, your eating has become a symptom of those deeper issues. Deal with those issues. So with that, as you deal with the issues, now you get, like any addict, what are my triggers? Is stress a trigger? Is anxiety a trigger? So you start, become more self-aware. And as you become aware, so let's say, you realize as soon as I'm feeling anxious or stressed, I start eating. Or as soon as I'm feeling bored, I start eating. Or as soon as I get home from work tonight and, or at night and I start relaxing, I start snacking. So you go, all of those things are triggers. Now, what safety nets do I need to put in place so I don't give in to those triggers? So you're building your recovery plan so you're dealing with the underlying stuff on one hand, but you're also dealing with here and now and putting plans in place to help you 
in those triggering times. Okay. Other practical things I've picked up over the years in dealing with people coming out of addiction. Number one, it's important if you want to get eating under control to begin to have some menus. So you don't just get home from work and say, oh, I wonder what I feel eating like eating tonight. Oh, okay, I'll get a bag of potato chips. You have a menu for each night and you start to do that. And that takes discipline. But if you're able to do it, it's a great thing. Importance of a shopping list. Don't go shopping and go, wonder what I feel like. And pick up whatever comes to your mind. That's a problem. And I always say this to clients. Be careful about taking your little children shopping with you for groceries. Because a lot of parents in recovery feel guilt. And their children will say, Mommy, Mommy, can I buy this? And you don't want to say no because your child might cry and be mad at you and not like you. So you let your child basically do half the shopping. And do you want to know, I, I read a study. If you go next time to Superstore or Safeway, Guess where they put all the children's things? The bottom shelf. Right at their eye level. Because they're trying to get the children to influence the decisions of the parent when it comes to shopping. So I encourage people, write your shopping list out ahead of time, hopefully based on the menus that you've laid out, and stick to it when you go shopping. And then, obvious one, don't go shopping when you're hungry. That tends to backfire. And be careful how much you eat out. That can really mess with your whole food stuff. And I, like I said, hunger, pan, hunger pangs don't necessarily mean that you're truly hungry. So begin to learn all of that. So that's what I wanted to say around this food issue. I think what I've seen is this. I don't deal with many addicts from drugs and alcohol who don't also have food problems. And so at some point in their recovery, this becomes an issue for them. And it becomes an issue that can be such a difficult struggle, it leads to getting constantly down on themselves. And they might think it's okay to do when you're young and your metabolism's high, but once you hit 40 and your metabolism starts slowing down, all of a sudden all of those things that you used to do and got away with start coming to haunt you. And you begin to say, man, I've got problems. And now they want to start dealing with it. So I hope this just gets you started on the right track for developing a healthy relationship with food. <clears throat> so last week I told you with the Christian part that I was going to start a new little se mini-series that the best illustration that I can find in the Bible of people with complex trauma are the Jewish people when they were in slavery in Egypt. And so we're told about that in the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus. And God uses a guy named Moses who is a Jewish boy, but he was raised in, as Pharaoh's son. And he, God uses Moses to bring the people of Israel out of Egypt. But what you find when they come out of Egypt is Egypt didn't come out of them. And so it's like you can take an addict out of the problem, but the problem seems to go with them. And so you begin to realize that these people, even though they have freedom from slavery, they're still slaves to them, their dark side. And you see all of these complex trauma behaviors starting to come up. And so I want to take you through part of the book of Exodus so you can see yourself in the people of Israel but also you can see how God responded to them. So here's what we're going to look at tonight. So let's say you are God. Some of you think you are, but let's say you, you, are, you are God and you are looking at 
3 million people with complex trauma and you're going, okay, where do I start in helping them heal? What is the very first thing that needs to be the foundation stone that everything else will build on? And if I don't get that stone right, then nothing else will matter. So what is the very first thing that God as a therapist has to help these people coming out of slavery and trauma get? And I love what it says, and so you're not going to like hearing it, but guess what it is? Trust. And God is saying unless they can learn to trust, they'll never get healthy. Some of you just groaned inside. Because what does complex trauma teach us? You can't trust anybody but yourself. If you trust people, they'll let you down and you'll get hurt. So trust gets beaten out of you. And what God is saying right up front is that trust peace is so important to the healing journey. Now... If God was to put up a sign-up sheet saying, who wants to sign up for trust classes? Nobody would sign up. So you know what I've learned? Nobody learns trust happily. We all learn trust kicking and screaming through the first lessons. And so what you're going to see tonight is that God is leading Israel to trust but what he's going to do is put them in a situation that they hate and get mad about. It doesn't lead them to trust, but it leads them to see that God cares for them and that he's trustworthy. And that is the starting point. So God begins to reveal to them who he is and that he is trustworthy. But that is not something they want to do. So let me kind of take you into that. What does God have to do? Number one, you can't trust somebody totally unless you know certain things about them. So they have to be trustworthy. So what does that mean? That means that they care about you. That means that they love you. That means that they're reliable. They keep their promises. But to do that, they got to be powerful. They got to be able to defeat enemies. They got to be able to come through at difficult times. So you need that kind of person, and they have to be constant. So God says, I have to show Israel who, what I am like, and then I got to put them in situations beyond their ability to handle where they're going to say, Oh, help, help, I'm in trouble. God, don't you care, don't you care? And then I'm going to come in and rescue them and that will show them in real life example how powerful I am and how much I care and how much I am committed to them. So that is the first thing God is going to do. So I am going to walk you through now the first three therapy sessions God gives to Israel, okay? Here we go. Therapy session number one. This is the one everybody loves. Because God says, sit as a spectator and just watch me work. So God began to do in Egypt, while Israel was still slaves, God began to do these miracles to try and get Pharaoh to say, there's no point fighting against Israel's God. He is way too powerful. So he is defeating me. I am going to let them go. So he turned the water into blood. He sent this darkness. He sent frogs all over the place, etc. And God was putting on a power show. And Israel was saying, wow, is this guy ever strong, ever powerful? Now to help you understand that, there are ten plagues. Each one of the plagues was directed at 10 of Egypt's favorite gods. So Israel, Egypt didn't have one god. They had all kinds of gods. So guess what their main god was? The Nile River. That was their source of water, which was their source of life. So they believed it was a god that gave them life. So God turned it 
the blood. And he says, I'm going to take on your great God, the Nile. <clears throat> and you'll see if I'm more powerful than that God. And he turned at the blood and showed that he was more powerful. Then their next big God was the sun. That was the other source of life. So God says, I'm going to turn the sun to darkness. So God took on every one of Egypt's ten gods. That wasn't all their gods, but he took on those ten gods and he defeated each one. And so Israel got this front row seat watching God show his power. They didn't have to do a thing. They were spectators. You want to know what that's like in recovery? You come and learn in class. And you get this head knowledge. And you go, boy, I'm loving learning all of these tools. This is so much fun. Problem is when you got to go home and apply them. It's not so much fun, but it's sure fun to learn, okay? And so that's what God does. Therapy session one, number one, he puts his power on display. Secondly, and this is the one nobody signs up for. He says, I got to put them in a situation <clears throat> that is way beyond their ability to handle. Now, Israel is going to get backed into a corner and they are going to kick and scream the entire time. They are not going to enjoy one second of this time. Much like early recovery. Much like certain parts of recovery where it's like God backs you into a corner and says, we're going to learn this lesson now. And you go, I don't want to learn this lesson now. This is too painful, too hard. And God says, I'm going to force you to go through this. And we kick and scream the whole way. So here's what happens. Israel, when they were leaving, God said, I'm going to give you a guide, which will be in the daytime, this huge thing of cloud. And at night, that's going to turn into fire, a pillar of fire. And you're just going to follow that. And that will lead you. And so that you'll have a sense that I'm with you a sense of my presence and that I'm guiding you and that'll be there every day. So they come out of slavery and the pillar of fire starts leading them away from Egypt. And then all of a sudden, the, the cloud and the pillar of fire turns and starts to turn them back towards Egypt. That's confusing. God, what are you doing here? And then in the distance, they start to see sandstorm and they begin to realize that's not a sandstorm. That's a whole bunch of people coming. So here's what happened. Pharaoh didn't let each, the Israelites go until the 10th plague, which God said, I'm going to take on your son, Pharaoh, who you consider to be a god, who can't die, and I'm going to put him to death. That was the crushing blow. And Pharaoh, out of a broken heart, said, get out of here. I don't want to deal with this God anymore. But shortly after they left, within a day or two, he's going, what was I thinking? Those three million people were my main workforce that did all kinds of stuff for free, and they kept our economy going. Without those three million people, our economy is going to crash. And we are going to be in huge trouble as a nation. So he has a change of heart. And he says, I got to go recapture them. And so he calls for his army. And he says, I want the best of the soldiers, as many soldiers as possible, to go back out, capture the Israelites again, and bring them back into slavery. So you imagine the Israelites, as they see this cloud of dust coming, and then all of a sudden they see chariots and they see soldiers, and they clue into what is happening. Pharaoh is sending his army to recapture us. Now, do you realize that none of the Israelites had been soldiers? They had been slaves. They don't have any weapons. They don't have any fighting skill. And here is the greatest, most powerful, skilled, technologically advanced army in the world a few miles away. Can you imagine the panic that set in? But what happened is the panic turned to anger at Moses and God. 
Why did you lead us out of Egypt? Was it so that we would die? Because that's, that's what it looks like is going to happen. So they start getting super angry at Moses and God and say it would have been better if we had stayed as slaves if you never got our hopes up in the first place. This is terrible. We hate you. We wish this never happened. And so they are not in a good place. So what they have done is a very complex trauma thing. They went to the worst case scenario. We're all going to die. It's hopeless. Let's give up and let's get angry. And they got super negative and they got all worst case. They forgot that God said, I will get you out of Egypt and make you a free people. And he had just given them a power show that showed he was greater than anything Egypt could throw at them. But in that moment of time, they forgot all about that. You want to know what happens to us often in recovery? We're going along great, and then a bad thing happens, and we forget all about what God's taught us and who he is. And we just go to worst case scenario, and we're mad at everybody, and we're panicking. And that's what they did. And so, what does God do? He says, don't be afraid, stand still, and watch me go to work. And you're, they're going, okay, it's not looking like you're doing anything. But what he is trying to say is stand still and get out of your limbic brain and start thinking again. I am going to rescue you. Remember, I just did it. I will continue to do it. So get back to thinking about now and what I've been doing for you for the last number of months. Get out of your limbic brain. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again because I'm going to fight for you. Stay calm. So what God is doing is a grounding technique he's, to try to get them emotionally regulated again. It doesn't work real well. They're not the most willing subjects. But then a couple things start to happen. Number one, a wind starts blowing and they see the Dead Sea or the Red Sea start to open up. And then, but the chariots are still coming. So then God takes this cloud and pillar of fire and he moves it behind the Israelites between the Egyptian soldiers and Israel so that it stops the soldiers from advancing. They hit this cloud so Israel should be saying wow God's protecting us look at them work no they're still panicking the wind blows all night as the cloud keeps the army at bay and when they get up in the morning there is a pathway across the sea and they start going across it the cloud lifts they start to panic again because they see the soldiers starting to chase them again and they're getting across the sea, and they see the soldiers coming down into the sea, and they're really starting to panic. And God says, just hang on, because all of a sudden, all of the chariot wheels started getting stuck in the mud. And they started falling apart. And it held up the army again. And then finally they got to the other side, and the sea closed, and the whole army was wiped out. So God provided. Now, Many of you had those lately where God puts you in the situation and he protects you, but man, you're panicking the whole time. You're not trusting yet, but you are getting kind of this demonstration of his commitment, love, and power. You know what really frustrates me about this story and about God? He waited till the 11th hour to rescue them. He, could, he didn't have to wait to 11.59. He could have saved them at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Do you want to know what God did? And this justifies what I do all the time, so pay attention. God says, you're feeling anxiety? Sit in it. It's not going to kill you. God could have taken every, all those uncomfortable feelings away. He could have transported them to the other side of the ocean or wiped out the army right away and they never would have gone through any of that anxiety. 
And he said, sit in it. Boy, that just justifies a lot of what I do. But the second thing I want you to realize is there's some lessons that we don't enjoy for one second. And we go through them and we go, why are you doing this, God? What's the point of this? This seems so cruel. This seems so wrong. And we get all kinds of reasons why it's a dumb idea. But then 10 years later, we look back and we go, wow, that lesson that I hated started a trusting process that I never would have got if I didn't have that lesson. And so some of the greatest lessons are taught by the most undesirable lessons. And we hate them in the moment, but over time, we are grateful for them. So we do not learn to trust by signing up for it. Do you realize that they're still not trusting God? But God rescued them anyways. But they saw God in a new way up close. And they saw God in a panic situation and how he came through when they needed him the most. And that started a trust thing. Now there's a third thing that God had to do. Third therapy session. It would have been really easy for Israel to have said, God, it was great that you showed us those 10 miracles back in Egypt. And it was great that you got us through the Red Sea. We trust you now. Thanks for the lessons. Do you want to know what happens to us when we get past a crisis? Often in a crisis, we run to God and say, we need you, I need you, I need you, I'm trusting you. As soon as the crisis is done, we say, bye God. I don't need to trust you right now because I can handle it from here. And God knows this. If we aren't desperately trusting him on a regular basis, we drift from him. And if we drift from him, we get into a darker place, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally. So if we're going to stay in a healthy place, we have to stay close to him. And if we ha are to stay close to him, we have to be put into a living situation where we have to trust every day. Because if we get a week or two where we don't have to trust, we drift from God. So what does God... Say for Israel, therapy session number three, I'm going to make you need me every day. Guess what you get in a, in a desert? No food, no stores, can't grow anything. Three million people. God could have said, here, I'm going to take this part of the desert and make it fertile and it'll rain there and you can be farmers. No, he didn't do that. You want to know what he said? Every day, I'm going to send some bread from heaven in the morning. And I'm going to send some quail in. And you're going to have your meat and bread every day. And then after that day, you're going to be out of food again. And tomorrow, you're going to start saying, God, please provide. And there's going to be manna, which is what the bread was called, and quail. And that's only going to be enough for one day. And then the next morning, you're going to say, God, please provide. You're going to keep being forced to trust me every day. Do you want to know something? God doesn't give you the strength for tomorrow's problems today. He doesn't give it till tomorrow. But we want God to give us the strength for the next year's problems today. So we don't need to trust him anymore. And so what God has got to do with us is teach us to trust every day. You want to know one of the things that I sometimes think is a downside of living in a prosperous country? Is that we can easily think we don't need God. And that's why God gives some people physical health problems, emotional mental health problems, addiction problems. Because every day there's not a solution that the world can provide that's going to satisfy it totally. So every day you come and say, God, please provide, because I'm struggling again. And it teaches us daily dependence. How do you like those three therapy lessons? All around trust. Do you see how important trust is? If we're ever going to get out of complex trauma. Do you want to know the 
sad part of this, 3 million people came out of Egypt. 40 or, or a year later, do you know how many people trusted God after one year of watching God provide manna every day, quail every day? Moses, Aaron, and two other people. And Miriam, five people trusted God. That means almost the three million that came out still refused to trust. And they died a miserable life. And so what you begin to realize is that those five that learned to trust, they moved on to fruitful, great lives that made a huge difference. The others just wandered around empty lives until they died in the desert. They never got to experience all the wonderful things God wanted to give them, but they wouldn't trust him enough to ever get them. And so this trust peace is so important. And I just hope if it's an area that you're really struggling in, you'll say, God, thank you that you're patient. You're sure patient with Israel and helping them learn to trust. But just keep teaching me and helping me to grow in this area.